is that Fred Rogers on television was just exactly the same as Fred Rogers in person. <coughs> and so many people who had meetings with him reported that. And that was certainly true for me the one time, <coughs> excuse me, I told Andy earlier, I've done about 30 radio interviews in the last several days, and so my voice is a little creaky, so I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, but um, the, uh, 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 the idea that he was just the same is not quite right. Uh, he can't, he, his style was the same, his personality was the same, but I think what one learned <coughs> over time was that the real Mr. Rogers was a very deep, very complicated, complex figure. And uh, he was a complicated guy, I suppose, to live with and to work with. He was very intense. He was very intentional about life. He was very focused on what he wanted to accomplish, not just in the neighborhood, but he was very focused on how he wanted to live his life, how he wanted to be with other people, how he wanted to uh, be an exemplar of the best human values. So yes, he seemed to be that same uh, simple, kindly, easygoing man on television, uh, but in fact, I think he was a very intense person, and he was a very serious thinker, too. sort of extraordinary, everything that he did. <clears throat> and it started with the Children's Corner uh, in the 1950s, uh, when he and Josie Carey had to do everything to keep the program moving forward. But it continued years later when he was uh, producing, writing and producing <clears throat> and starring in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He did everything. Uh, he wrote the scripts. Uh, he had a lot of people who helped him write the scripts like Elizabeth Siemens, so I think was here this evening. Uh, but every word and every script, he would review very carefully. Often he would go over them uh, with Dr. Margaret McFarland at Pitt. Uh, he wrote the songs. He wrote 200 songs and 12 operas. Uh, he performed many of the puppet characters. He was the central figure, talking to the children on the show. He always had a producer and a director for the show, but everybody knew, including the producers and the directors, that Fred Rogers knew exactly what he wanted, and he would make that clear. So he literally played every single role. And if you think about um, Sesame Street and how successfully, <coughs> excuse me, how successfully it was commercialized with uh, selling the Muppets, uh, selling all sorts of other artifacts having to do with Sesame Street. Uh, and then you think of all, all that Fred Rogers created for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, in addition to the programs themselves. Uh, if he had wanted to go to New York and go to one of the major networks and commercialize that, literally, it would have been hundreds of millions of dollars. But he didn't want it. He wanted to stay with, with public television. He wanted to stay making television for children. He wanted to fulfill what for him was his ministry to children on television. You know, you, you describe a man really doing everything. He's writing the music, he's writing the scripts, he's, he's handling the puppets, he's doing stage direction, and even some of the stage set design. Oh. Um, he's a perfectionist. So what, what is it like working with a perfectionist on the set? Did, did you get any stories out of people that would give us some insight into what it was like? Uh, all of the people <clears throat> on the staff that I interviewed, and many who, who uh, uh, created oral histories, uh, there was a great project early on in the Fred Rogers Center's history in Latrobe in which uh, Bill Eisler, who, who was, well, he was, he was directing the Fred Rogers Center, he was also running family communications. 
and he was the president of the school board. I mean, the guy was a Hercules in terms of everything he was accomplishing. But one of the things he accomplished was he got a grant from the Buell Foundation. I think Gene Robinson, who was the chair of the board, is, is here tonight, uh, to do oral histories of all 63 people who were living who um, were associates of Fred, who had worked with him, who knew him, who were family, who were friends. <clears throat> and that created this extraordinary body of work without which the biography could never have been done. But in addition to those 63, I think I did about 55 interviews on my own. And all of the staff that I talked to loved, adored Fred Rogers, and they felt very strongly that he encouraged them and gave them lots of opportunity for growth. But he was utterly precise on what he wanted, how he wanted it, when he wanted it, and they all, they all learned that. One of the things that Elizabeth Seaman said to me was, the staff used to say to one another, <coughs> it's not your neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Yeah. You know, here at the History Center, we, we celebrate innovation. And uh, when I think of Fred Rogers as an innovator in children's television and early childhood media and education, I, I wonder if you could maybe say a few words about Fred Rogers as innovator. I think what one of the things that's remarkable to me, in, in addition to being such a great educator, and, and we need to talk at some point about his impact on the field of education, and such an extraordinary uh, figure in terms of being uh, an exemplary person that people still today take uh, uh, messages from in terms of how to live life, how to react to what's going on around him. In addition to that, he was extraordinarily entrepreneurial. Uh, it was in the late uh, 1940s <clears throat> when he came home <clears throat> on spring break from Rollins College, where he was studying music and Joanne was studying music. And his parents had a television set, probably the first one in Latrobe, 1948, 40, 49, it was, I think. And um, he watched it during the whole weekend that he was home. And he was horrified, as this has been told so many times, that Fred Rogers was horrified at the slapstick, high in your face nature, particularly of children's television, but he saw it, but almost nobody else saw it at that time, that it could be an extraordinarily powerful tool for education. So he had he saw the cutting edge technology of his day, like the latest apps and, and social media technology that evolves today. And you know, television was as transformative then as all of these media uh, implementations are today. He saw the cutting edge technology and he saw this, this future. And it really, uh, he, it turned him into an entrepreneur in television and it kind of flipped his life because his mother thought he was gonna go to seminary and become a minister, which he eventually did. His father thought he was still gonna get to talk Fred into becoming a businessman and take over the, the family company. And then he said at the end of that spring break, I want to go to New York and get into television. <laughs> when he did, again, he was extraordinarily innovative. He made television that was slow, that had long breaks of silence, uh, that, was, that was gentle, uh, that did all these things that nobody else on television in the 60s and 70s, nobody else was doing. Think about that. Some of you were old enough to remember the 60s and 70s, and, and think of children's television. I mean, spooky sales and, and uh, clowns bopping each other over the head, slapstick stuff. Uh, they would crack balls. They'd go for the laugh when someone got injured. Yeah. Uh, and, and I can imagine Fred watching this stuff and saying, no, no, no. But, it, but instead of saying no, 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 and turning it off. He said no, 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 and thought of what it could be moved toward. It took him a couple decades to move it toward what he was envisioning right. Right. that weekend at home. But he early recognized that it was a tool of, of the first order yes. for education. And you know, a lot of people have asked me, 
would Fred be horrified at social media <coughs> and, and uh, all of the internet, computer uh, communications and learning that goes on today? And no, I don't think he'd be horrified. I think he'd be disappointed in all the ways it's used in cheap ways that devalue people, devalue learning. But he wouldn't be horrified. He would, he would be setting to work to figure out how to use it in a much more uplifting way. Well, you know, we feel that we know Fred Rogers. Uh, we, he came into our homes, and, and we, we can think of episodes, and we can think of the, the impact that, that he made on us or our, our children, uh, but we don't really know that much about him, especially his childhood, his growing up. Uh, what did you find in your research uh, impacted him? How did he turn into the person he became? As I did the research and read a lot of books about television and about education, <coughs> I, I came to feel it was more and more important that I sort of figure out how he became Mr. Rogers, rather than dwelling as much on the years after Mr. Rogers' neighborhood started. And many of you have probably seen the wonderful film won't You Be My Neighbor, which is a beautiful piece of work. <laughs> which so perfectly illustrates Fred as a, as a serious thinker. But the movie really